so most of what we're going to do now is review for the lab exam, which is going to be next um, next class. Um, it will be when we would be normally having lab. So we'll do our lecture. We're going to do the cover the muscles, um, take a break. And then it'll be, it'll also be a proctorio administered exam, um, but it'll be slightly different in that you are allowed to use your lab notebook. So maybe I should just say that. Lab exam. So it's this Thursday. but not other notes, etc. Right, so in your lab notebook is not supposed to be a place full of crib notes and stuff. It should be where you, it's the stuff you've been turning in. Your objectives, hypotheses, your data, your discussion of what it means. You know, so it's gonna, if you've done a good job of it, it's gonna really, go a long way towards making this lab exam pretty straightforward, right? Because if you've been able, you know, so for every lab, it's really important that you know, like, what was the objective? What was the point of it? What were the independent and dependent variables? What did you actually find? What does it mean in terms of the bigger concepts we've been discussing? Hopefully you've all written that up really nicely in your in your um, lab notebook. So it's going to make your life way easier. Um, the other thing you need to turn in, which I am, let me just, I'll show it to you and we can just do it. I, I'll activate it. Um, go back into the modules here. So sometime between now and Thursday morning, I would like you to scan and give me your table of contents. So here I, I'm going to activate it here. Submit PDF of lab book table of contents. Um, which is, I'll just like, let's make it available right now. So it's due April, so it's due that night, but I'll make it available like right now. All right, so, and again, this should be something you've been doing the whole time, right? Every lab you do, you should be putting it in the front there and creating your table of contents. So this is just another little PDF so I can make sure corroborate like your your lab book and make sure it all kind of fits together and also make sure you've done your table of contents because that's going to really help you like when you get to some question about the enzyme lab or the reflex lab or whatever you're like oh let's go to my table of contents and go right straight to it so so that is that's on the table now so that at this point you know a number of people have already submitted all the labs um some people are on their way are on track and again some people are really not at all you know again i'm very concerned about um like i said the more you have your lab book together the more this lab exam is going to just be straightforward the more the lab book is not put together, um, the more this lab exam is is going to be it's going to be um, not so pretty. Um, so let's talk a little more about let's talk a bit about sig figs. Like one of the things that came up when I was grading some of these things was realizing. 
Like, I'm not sure everybody remembers significant figures. We've talked a little bit about them. I know you've done them in chemistry, but I think it's worth going over it one more time because it's important, the idea. When you're taking measurements, Whenever you take measurements, you're limited by the, you know, the accuracy of the instrument that you're using to, to um, take the measurement. There's accuracy and precision. Um, basically, significant figures tells you, like, how much can you trust this number? Right, so if I said, like, if I said something is... Fifteen centimeters, and I said something is fifteen point oh centimeters. Even though mathematically those should be the same, in terms of significant figures, they're very different. You know, this has two sig figs. This has three sig figs. This is actually saying fifteen plus or minus, um, like you know half a centimeter. This is saying 15.0 plus or minus point like 05 centimeters. So this one here, here I know it's somewhere between 15, you know, this is somewhere between 14 and a half and 15 and a half. Pretty wide range. This one, I know it's somewhere between 14.95 and 15.05. So it's a much, tells me much closer that I can trust, you know, what, what the actual value is. So it really does matter to use a sig figs, to use the significant figures, but you also need to be careful to be responsible with them. You can only use as many as you actually can actually trust the information. So for instance, when you're doing, um, what do you call it, um, averages. You know, if I, let's say I do one measurement and it's 14.5 centimeters and another one said it was 15.8 centimeters and another measurement said it was 14.2 centimeters. You know, and I wanted the average. Well, what is the average of, let's say these were the kicks on the reflex lab or whatever, or let's say they were the distances you could measure, a, you know, two point discrimination or whatever. I'm going to do, if I do 14.5, enter 15.8 plus 14.2 plus three divided by, you know, I have 14.833 centimeters. That's the average. You know, is this what I would write down for my data for the average kick or whatever? No. No. Because this is implying if I have this many places past the decimal point, I am implying that these are significant. I'm saying that that's meaningful. That that I that this number here is somewhere between 14.833 um, or 8335 and 14.83295 or whatever. Yeah. Right. So I'm saying that it is really tightly. You know, the fact is, though, I don't. Each of these numbers was somewhere, this was somewhere in between you know, 14.4 and 14, 14.45 and 14.55. You know, each of these numbers, because they only have their limited sig figs, are, there's a lot of wiggle room in there. So there's no way we got this kind of accuracy here. Um, so what is the rule when you're doing calculations with sig figs? With measurements like this? doesn't have to be the same amount of sig figs. Yeah, you are only entitled to the number of sig figs in your least accurate piece of data. So if my 
data how has three sig figs i am only allowed to use three this is meaningless whatever is beyond three sig figs in the calculation doesn't mean anything because the data that went in to calculate it didn't have that didn't have that kind of accuracy so i could say the average is 14.8 centimeters done right it doesn't make any sense to go any deeper than that Right, I had, yeah, I can like, I'll just. This actually has a couple of issues. I think, again, the, I think that kind of, you know, sanity check is also still useful. So this was a, um, general sensation, you know, two point threshold, like what's the minimum that you, the distance they can be where you can tell it's two instead of one. And yet you take a look, it's like, first of all, you're only supposed to get one number because it's like, what is the, what is the threshold? But then they have like zero. It's like, that makes no sense. How could you say, well, like when the two points are zero apart, that's the minimum when you could tell it's two. It's like, they're not two, they're not apart if there's zero distance, right? So when you're like kind of recording data and thinking about what am I doing and does this make any sense? You always want to kind of do that sanity check and go back and like, does this make any sense at all? And again, sometimes it doesn't, in which case you go back and like, where did I, where did I go off here? Right, it happens. It happens to the best of us. I do it that myself when I'm, I do my research and I double check my answers and I'm like, what the heck's going on here? Then I have to kind of backtrack and realize what what happened. But like in this case, this makes no sense. Like this isn't clear what they're talking about, um, let alone what these averages would mean. So. Again, two point discrimination is just going to be what is the distance where you can have them apart and still know it's two. Um, later on in this one, and you start getting into this, like with the um, tactile localization. You know, so they have they do their averages and they end up saying 21.475 millimeters as the average, right? This is going to three decimal points past millimeters. This is going to microns, to millionths of a meter. It's obvious that this person doesn't have the ability to measure things accurately to within a millionth of a meter. That's something you know we can't do really with the equipment we got. So it makes no sense to have these numbers here. So if, um, you know, if the, the largest thing had three, then you could only have three here. This would be 21.4. Um, and in fact, you have to be careful when you're writing down these numbers. Like, you know, this person was measuring um, four centimeters. If you're using sig figs and write four centimeters, that means somewhere between three and a half, I mean, 3.5 and 4.5 centimeters. But with a normal ruler that goes to millimeters, you could actually get to the nearest millimeter. This should have been 4.0 centimeters. And like I've been mentioning, 4.0 centimeters is different than four centimeters in this practical world of sig figs. So you wanna be careful with, with your numbers this way. Um, so other questions about that, you know, you want, yeah, cause there's, there's limits, you know, to what we can measure and you want to be careful that you're not insinuating that, you know, this thing to kind of a higher degree of accuracy than you actually do. Um, all right.
So, lab exam. Mm -mm. It all started with chem review. You know, what were some of the take home messages of the chem review lab? Well, I should also mention while we're doing this, it's okay to take notes, but it's not okay to take notes in your lab notebook, right? Your lab notebook is not a place where you're doing crib notes for something. If you're taking notes during the review and realize like there's something that you need to like solidify or augment, you know, that's another thing, but it's not okay to just have your lab book and start scribbling little notes in there, like as we're reviewing things, because that's not what the lab book is about. It's, it's not a place to put crib notes. It's a place to um, record what you did and what you found and what it means. Um, so I'm putting that out there. So chem review. We looked at how different salts, like what they look like and how they behaved in water. Yeah, so first we used the electrolytes. And what were some of the defining qualities of electrolytes when you put them in the water? They can conduct electricity. Yeah, so we saw that. And how did we know that they could conduct electricity? They disassociated. Um, so that was kind of why they could, but how, how did we, what evidence did we have that they could conduct electricity? Because we heard a buzz. Yeah, so that's one of the things about the lab exam. It's going to be about the, you know, concepts, the theory for sure, but it's also going to be about the practical um, things like how did we know that it could conduct electricity? How did we know that the cells lysed when we put the different RBCs in different solutions? You know, you should know both the um, you know, what happened, but how did we also tell? Mm. You know, that's why I want you guys to describe things well and to draw pictures or things like that. Um, so conduct electricity. What else? What else did electrolytes do when you put them in the water? They dissolved. Yeah, they dissolved. Right, so they went into solution. They just said you couldn't see them anymore. Right, which was similar. What else dissolved when we put it into water? Sugar. Yeah, the sugar also dissolved in the water. Um, how was it? How was it different from putting the electrolytes? It did not um, buzz or conduct electricity. Right, so we saw this kind of fundamental difference. It didn't buzz to conduct electricity and kind of theoretically, you know, why did that make sense? Because it doesn't dissociate. Exactly, it doesn't dissociate. It stays intact as kind of an overall neutral molecule. So there's no charge carriers, right? So that was a big part of the lab. What happened when you tried to put the electrolytes into oil instead? They're still visible. They don't dissolve. Yeah, they didn't dissolve. Why did that make sense? Because they're all like and they're in oil. Right. So, and what is oil? Polar. Wait, say, say it one more time. Nonpolar. Nonpolar. It has to be nonpolar, right? Nonpolar. Right. The things that have charge are polar. Those and they're going to dissolve in solvents that also have charge and charge imbalances. So, right, because I mean, I said a core. I mean, when we get later on to that RBC lab, understanding that is going to make a difference in understanding how some molecules are penetrating or not. Like when we get to um, yeah, so it's, it's important to remember, remember that. 
Um, what else? We looked at how did how did glucose solution look compared to like just starch solution? Glucose looked clear compared to the starch, which was more cloudy. And why did why what is the implications of that? The starch was a larger molecule, so it like it, it scattered the light. What's that squirrel? What it what do we call it? A colloid. Colloid. Yeah. So it's the idea of a colloid where you have these larger solutes where you are then they still go into solution. They don't settle, but they do scatter light. They look more cloudy. Um, so chem review, you know, when you go over the lab, you're just making sure that, you know, this one doesn't have an objective and a hypothesis, so independent, dependent variable, but it has kind of the core concepts. You just got to make, you know, make sure that you are familiar with all that. You know, the next one is the first one where we did have the hypothesis driven lab, you know, the old jumping lab. You know, for each of the labs that is hypothesis driven, you need to be clear that you know what are the independent variables and the dependent variables and how we tested for them and what our quest, you know, what your hypothesis was and what the data said, whether it supported your hypotheses and all that. Like for the jumping lab, what were the independent variables? Calf circumference, BMI, um, height, and forget the last one. Oh, weight. Right, because actually calf circumference, height, and weight were the ones we actually measured. BMI you could calculate as an index from the height and the weight. And then what was our dependent variable? The height of the jump. Exactly. So, you know, and then everybody had their own hypotheses. You know, on the exam, sometimes I'll ask you about your own, your own things from your own lab book, like your observations. Other times it will be about the group data, other times, you know, so there could be questions about, you know, your own particular hypothesis. It could be questions about uh, more gen generic things, uh, but what did we what did we find when we actually kind of looked at the data in more detail? Did we find any interesting relationships? No, it was pretty much only height, um, individual height and jump height. Um, so we did see we did see a positive relationship between height and jump height. Um, and gender. Well, and gender, right? Male versus female was a pretty big difference too. Um, and in fact, when we looked at the jump height versus height, we saw some fascinating effects that it wasn't really so much about height as maybe a gender thing as well. Um, and some people actually looked at calf in more detail. Um, can someone tell me who looked at the calf with more detail, what they found? There's actually interesting stuff with the calf versus jump. There was a positive relationship between jump height and healthy BMI and an inverse relationship with unhealthy BMI and jump height. Yeah, we actually, it was actually really cool. If you separated like healthy BMI subjects from unhealthy BMI subjects, you actually found, and it kind of makes sense, healthy BMI means bigger calves, probably more muscle. They actually did seem to jump higher. We saw a dramatic negative correlation between calf circumference and jump with the unhealthy BMI people, which again makes sense because their larger calf probably just means that you're kind of more overweight and more weight and less strength so you know so all that kind of stuff you know in in the lab exam i might ask questions like here's some data maybe this is some other classes data and what is this telling us 
or it could be our data and you need to like interpret it and put it in relationship to your hypotheses or it could be anything. You know, the, the nature of a lab exam is though it will bring in the actual lab itself. It's not just going to be about, um, about, you know, factoids or something. Um, let me just get my little calendar here. Jumping lab. Oh, then, then was the osmometer lab. So osmometer lab, what's our independent and dependent variables in this puppy? So the deep Dependent would be. I guess you want to school it here. <laughs> what, what's that? The rate of osmosis. Wait, so wait, which one? Hold on. I... The dependent variable is the rate of osmosis. Yes, this was going to be the rate of osmosis. And what was the independent variable? What were we varying? The concentration gradient was the concentration gradient across the membrane. How did we actually measure the rate of osmosis? By measuring the rise of water through a um, burette. Yeah, well, and it, it was it was not necessarily a burette, but the little um, through the little glass tube, plastic tube, right? We could see if as water enters, crosses the membrane, goes in there, it starts going up. We could measure it at every ten minutes, and by seeing how fast it's going up per time, remember rate. Is just distance over time. Right, this this should feel kind of familiar. It wasn't that that long ago. It's probably not quite as dramatic when you don't do it yourself. Right. So I, that's probably part of what's going on too. Is you know, so we watched the water go up the tube and we timed how or we measured how far did it go every 10 minutes and then we could just calculate we could say oh it went if it went up let's say it went up three minute three millimeters in the last 10 minutes then i could say three millimeters over 10 minutes that is going to be 0.3 millimeters per minute as the rate the average rate in that time slot right so i could calculate a rate just by seeing how far did it go you know and again that's going to be my measure of rate of osmosis for this lab is in change in height per per minute. Um, how did we how did we measure the concentration gradient? I mean, we did the different concentrations of sucrose and kind of just 
compared them. Yeah, so we set it up. Um, and again, it wasn't just about the sucrose. What's a, a gradient is the difference. So it's like we knew we 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 could we knew what was inside. We knew what's outside. Outside was distilled water. You know, zero zero concentration. Inside was either twenty percent sucrose or forty percent sucrose. So in one case, we had a concentration gradient of zero to twenty. Percent in another case, we had a concentration gradient, the difference zero to 40%. So we just kind of set, set it up. So we could look at two different conditions of the independent variable and then could follow the rate of osmosis in those two cases. And what did we find? The diffusion rate of the 40% solution was faster than the 20%. Yeah, so the, the rate of osmosis was much faster. We saw, I don't actually, I could bring it up a little later, but basically it was almost twice as fast. Um, and, you know, I said, oh, that this is a semi permeable membrane that lets water through and not sucrose. How do you know? How do you know for sure that sucrose could not cross the membrane there? What evidence was there that sucrose actually could not cross the membrane? Wasn't it dyed? Um, no, remember I was saying the dye, the dye was just to see things, but the dye didn't really cause any, that, that, that was not, that's not it. Because the water level rose in the tube? Yeah, exactly. Did everybody hear Chris? Right? Because the water was actually rising in the tube. I mean, what would have happened if I put... 40% sucrose in here, and it was distilled water out here. But let's say the sucrose actually could cross the membrane, what would happen? It would mix into the beaker? Yeah, the sucrose would follow its diffusion gradient. It would leave here, equalize inside and outside, so there's no osmotic gradient, and there'd be no, no change in height of the water. Right, so the only reason uh, there was an osmotic pressure that persisted that could fight gravity and push the water up was because sucrose was trapped. Right, so that's an important point here. Um, you know, did it just keep going up and up forever or did it start slowing down or what? What happened as once the water starts going up? What happens to the rate once once we start this experiment? It decreases over time. And why was that? Because the concentration within the um, tube and sucrose is actually decreasing as you add more water. And so one thing we've got is the more we have water coming into the tube, the more we're diluting the sucrose and the more the gradient is actually becoming less. So that is going to decrease the concentration gradient, which will decrease the rate. So that's one thing. Um, although if we think about it, it's never going to be zero because there's always going to be some sucrose inside the tube and compared to zero outside the tube. So that well, the rate will slow down, but it will never stop. If you just think about the concentration difference. Is there anything that causes it to finally stop? Gravity? Yeah, that's the other thing. The more we have the water going up the tube, the more we have what we call the hydrostatic head. The, just 
the water pressure due to the weight of the water pushing back down. So at some point, the osmotic pressure driving the water into the system is going to perfectly be balanced by the gravitational pressure or the hydrostatic head pulling the water back down. You know, and then it's going to stop, assuming that the tube is tall enough. Otherwise, it'll kind of spooge out the top. So, any questions about this? Right. I mean, this this stuff. These the osmo osmosis is gonna be playing a major role in the class until like the very last day, pretty much. So you really want to have a good kind of instinct about osmosis. You know, the next lab kind of took these osmotic ideas into a more um, you know more practical thing where we had red blood cells. you know, and put them into different kinds of solutions. Um, what were the independent and dependent variables for this red, you know, fluid balance in RBC lab? Independent variables were um, various solutes and solute concentrations, and then the dependent was um, what happened to the blood, red blood cells. Yeah, exactly. Right. The independent variable we varied the solutions. We varied both by solute. What kind of stuff was it? What well, solute? Solute was it? Sodium chloride or sucrose or urea or whatever. We also varied concentrations. Like we had, you know. 0.1 molar saline, saline, or we had, you know, 0.3 molar saline. So we could vary both what was dissolved and then the concentration that it was at. And then we took a look. What happened to the to the red blood cell in that solution? Um, how could we tell? What were the actual techniques we could use to figure out what happened to the red blood cell under the different conditions. If there was a pellet or not, and if the supernatant was clear or if it was kind of a reddish pinkish color. Right, so we put it in the centrifuge and we spun it down and what did those different things mean? How could you interpret those? So we looked for pellets, we looked for supernatant, and how did you interpret those things? What did they tell you about what happened? Whether or not it went through hemolysis or crenation. And describe more detail how you could tell. Well, hemolysis is when it um, explodes. So you would have, um, the coloration and cordation, you would have the pellet. Right, so if we had hemolysis with case things exploded, you spill the hemoglobin into solution, which now no longer will spin down when you're centrifuging. So you'll have this red supernatant. That is a sign that red blood cells exploded and released hemoglobin. Pellet. As long as you have a pellet, that means there's some cells that are still intact because the cells are big enough to get pulled down. If you had like total hemolysis, right, there'd, whoop, there'd be no pellet. If you, in fact, we saw this when we looked at like kind of the glycerol with, um, that was only in for five minutes, we saw, or actually in test tube, the test tube with the, um, 0.1 molar NaCl look kind of like this. You know, what does this mean? 
if you saw something where there's red supernatant, but there's also a pellet. Partial hemolysis? Yeah, probably partial. Like some of them burst because otherwise we wouldn't have red in the supernatant, but some of them are still intact. Otherwise we wouldn't have a nice visible pellet still. Right, so making sure you can interpret what this means is gonna be important, right? Like I said, the lab practical is about understanding the concepts, but it's also about understanding the actual practical way that we got the information and figured things out, how we did the experiment. Um, you know, what did this look like when we put the red blood cells into distilled water? Total hemolysis. It's like total hemolysis. And again, how could we tell from just looking at the tube? It was completely, there was no pellet and it was red colored. Yeah, exactly. So, so that again, make sure you're thinking like that, are able to really kind of make sense of how to interpret the tube. Um, and what, if you were trying to kind of come up with a hypothesis of why or what is going to happen? What were the two main things you had to think about? The osmolarity and um, the penetration. Exactly. Right. So osmolarity. We know that the cell is always going to be 0.3 osmolar inside. So we need to look outside here. And what is the osmolarity here? And how does it compare? That's the first thing. And again, if it's a non-penetrating solute, you're done. Because then if it's you know greater than 0.3 out here, the water is gonna be going um, in, in out of the cell. If it's less than 0.3, it's gonna be going into the cell. If it's balanced, isoosmotic, it'll be isotonic. Everything's gonna be in equilibrium. What happened when we had our our penetrating solutes like urea and stuff. Remember, we had like 0.3 osmolar urea. What happened in that case? It was total hemolysis. And why did that make sense? Because urea is able to penetrate. And then how does that how does that affect things? It becomes a hypotonic solution. Yeah, exactly. So as the urea enters into the cell, then the water is going to follow the solute. So the water starts going in. So we are now officially mm -hmm. in a, even though it's an isoosmotic solution, it's considered a hypotonic solution because it's going to cause water to enter the cell and ultimately kind of cause hemolysis. So, you know, so... We saw that with urea. We saw that with the ammonium chloride, which again is not a intuitive one. That only works because of the special bicarbonate chloride exchanger that you find in red blood cells. It actually won't cause hemolysis in a white blood cell because white blood cells don't have those transport proteins in their membrane. It will selectively only lyse red blood cells. Um, Glycerol. Glycerol was an interesting one. What did we notice about glycerol? Short term um, partial hemolysis, and then when exposed for a long time, it caused total hemolysis. Right. So it penetrates, but not that fast. So if you don't wait too long, the cells, most of the cells might be okay. But the longer you wait, the more and more it manages to get across the membrane and the cells explode. And again, different animal cells have different, um, different permeabilities. Like I said, when we did this, we, did, we used um, human blood up to just a few years ago and urea would just explode the cells immediately. And then we started using the bovine blood using the same technique and it was not hemolyzing very much at all. And we're like, this is weird. 
And then that's where we went and found some papers looking at the relative permeability of different animal cells to urea and realized that cow blood is not as permeable to urea as human blood cells. Right, and lots of diff different, hu different cells in different animals are, I don't know if I mentioned like in human blood cells, which we're, we're gonna look at in more detail next week, but human red blood cells don't even have a nucleus in them. That's why they look kind of like puckered in. They eject their nucleus before they go into service. So they're just a bunch of hemoglobin and not much else. Avian blood, bird blood, actually has a nucleus still in red blood cells. It's just the way it is for a bird as opposed to human blood cell. But it can it can lead to you know funny stories like I heard from somebody once where someone came in with you know with bloody urine and stuff and wanting you know basically wanting opiates because they had kidney stones and they were in excruciating pain and they basically looked at the blood under the microscope and saw that it was it was basically chicken blood because it all the red blood cells had nuclei in it so the person was just trying to score some drugs so it's, yeah so it's a little if you're trying to fool somebody don't use chicken blood just like a so so human blood cow blood pretty similar but not exactly the mm -hmm. same probably in other ways as well um besides urea permeability um could you like phys could how could you tell or could you tell if the cells crenated in this setup by comparing it to the control which was isotonic and what what could you see that the pellet was smaller yeah so it, it's it's in general it's if you really are careful and add just exactly the same amount of blood then it makes sense that crenated cells are going to take up less volume than isotonic cells, which we did see. We could see that the pellet with the crenated cells actually was a little smaller. Um, and again, I talked about the idea if you have a bowl, you know, with six grapes and six raisins, you know, the six raisins are going to take less, less space. And that's kind of what crenated cells are. They're like little raisins, right? And again, we didn't actually see them under the scope because we couldn't, but we did have photomicrographs for you to figure out which one makes sense for the different tubes. And again, as the cells crenate, they get puckered up and small and spiky. A regular, a happy cell is going to you know, look kind of like a like a disc with a pucker in the middle. And then it is possible to have hypotonic cells that don't pop. You know, cells are not totally like unable to hold themselves together. You know, so you can have like a happy cell or you can actually have a cell that is getting kind of poofed out, hypotonic, but hasn't exploded yet. You know, so, you know, I have pictures of all of that. You know, the crenated cells, the isotonic cells, the slightly hypotonic. If it's, if it's very hypotonic, then you don't really see anything because they just kind of break apart into fragments of membrane or whatever. So, so that was that was lab. You know, again, this is a, an important lab as well because this is the kind of thing that becomes very practical when you're just on the floor and you're hooking somebody up with IV bags and stuff. The osmolarity, the concentration of what you are putting into them really matters. And the concentration is going to depend on what kind of solute, like the concentration for, you know, sugar is going to be very different than for salt because one is going to dissociate, one's not going to dissociate. And, you know, being able to understand this idea of osmolarity and how it relates to concentration and how the osmolarity compared to inside the cell is being the most important thing, all that 
you know, that's important. So you, it makes sense of why are they putting this into the patient and why is that a good thing and not gonna kill them? Um, okay. All right, this is one of the labs that often gets people a little confused. Although this is where I do think the going online, I think this has helped, you know, in some ways having to do more of the kind of background work and having little videos to watch. Like I'm thinking even once we're back in the classroom, I'm going to keep some of the preliminary work similar on this because it seems I actually think people had an easier time with this than when we just try to just do it all in the class. They had a little more time to think about it. Um, IVDV. What is our independent and dependent variables for the enzyme lab? IV is concentration of substrate. And dB is reaction rate. Exactly. Right, and we, the thing we did, our substrate was just hydrogen peroxide. We could use different concentrations of that. We used the enzyme catalase constant amount in every rate, in every reaction, as this broke apart into H2O and oxygen. We could measure the rate um, how did we actually measure the, re the rate that this reaction was going? How did we get a measure? Because we could get the concentration easy. It's just what's the ratio of hydrogen peroxide to water? That's our rate. That's our concentration. But reaction rate was not as straightforward whatsoever. Uh, ML of O2 per second. Right, and how did we how did we actually get there? So we did measure it in mils of O2 per second, but how did we actually measure that number for any particular trial? Uh, in the burette. Um, but even more, it was a whole process. Do you remember what we did for each, for every single trial? You had to find the slope. Yeah, so we looked at time every five seconds, looked at the mills of oxygen getting made as time went by. So if this is for some trial, you could measure how much oxygen is at each five seconds. Eventually, Eventually, this thing just kind of levels off. What does that mean when this is just level? Reaction's over. Yeah, exactly. This means the reaction's over. We've used up all of the substrate. Um, so no more oxygen getting made, even if you wait till the cows come home, because there's no more substrate to break down. Um, but what we could do is when the reaction is going, we took a ruler and got a best fit line. And then once we got that best fit line of what we thought it was doing, we could do our rise over run. That's our slope. And that slope is that reaction rate. Right? So for every single trial, we had to do this whole, whole um, procedure where you have to graph out the oxygen versus time, 
do a best fit line for when the reaction's going before it's dying, get the slope, calculate that, and then use that as your reaction rate for that trial. And then what do you do? Once you get, you do this like six times, what, what do you do next? Then you make a new graph and you put all those points, um, your reaction rate over the substrate concentration by the, by trials. Exactly. So again, if we go back to the whole point of this thing was, you know, the objective is always what is the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. So ultimately what we wanted to get is this relationship. So concentration of substrate would be you know, we had like 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100%. And this would be reaction rate in mils of O2 per second. And, you know, so ultimately this is the graph that we wanted where we could actually answer our question, see if our hypotheses were supported or not. Right, and each dot on this graph, you have to go through that whole thing here. Each one of these graphs and calculations will give you a single dot on this graph. You know, for whatever trial it is, you have to calculate what is the reaction rate for that trial using that slope. Right, so again, it gets, I know it can get confusing because both of the graphs look kind of similar, but what's on the X and Y axes are very different. Um, what would it mean if I had a graph that looked kind of like this? That we reach a saturation point of about 80%. Right, so here, this is kind of what you normally expect. As you increase the substrate, you increase reaction rate. So for the first few dots, we're having more, higher concentration of substrate. We're getting a faster reaction rate. At this point, we are increasing the substrate concentration, and yet we are kind of flat here. We're not getting faster. We're at some maximum rate. Remember, we talked about that whole concept of saturating the enzyme. So no matter how much more concentrated the substrate is, this, the enzyme is working as fast as it can. So, so are there questions about this whole enzyme lab? Like I know this one is one that tends to kind of get people a little mixed up sometimes. Yeah, that's an understatement. I know this is one that often, often gets people mixed up a lot of times. I just had a question like for my 100%, it's higher than the 80% one. Um, Right. So what would that mean? So what if the what if it looked like this? So the reaction rate just continued to increase and in that it hasn't reached saturation? Exactly. So it could be, you know, it could be there is not saturation or there is saturation. And sometimes it's kind of tricky to tell because there's some subjectiveness in how you pick your points to calculate those um, calculate those slopes. Right, so if this is a little more one way or another way, you know, so it's a little tricky. But like that information wouldn't hurt me for the lab exam. No, no, not at all. Okay. Not at all. As long as your data, as long as you're, you know, you're writing things that are congruent with what you wrote in your lab notebook, that's all good. You know, if I drew a picture this particular picture and saying what is happening here
you know, you should be able to tell in this particular case, saturation is happening. Right. So if, if I say in this particular case, illustrated by this graph, are we seeing saturation? You should be able to say, why yes. Um, what else I have here? Reflex. In this one, we don't have to go that. What is, you should know, what is the IV and DV for the reflex lab? The IV was whether or not we were doing the gendrastics maneuver. Exactly. Whether you're doing gendrastics maneuver and the dependent variable. The magnitude of the stretch reflex. Uh-huh. Exactly. And we looked at two different two different stretch reflexes. We looked at the patellar reflex and we looked at the calcaneal one. You know, and for the most part, you know, we saw facilitation which is kind of what you expect. And like I said, this is a part of a normal neurological exam. You know, and the rest of this reflex lab is more about the demonstrations, pupillary reflexes and um, things like that. Um, what is particularly interesting, what happens if you shine a light in somebody's eye, what happens to their pupil? It constricts. It constricts. Is that sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic. 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 If you wanted to block that, what kind of drug would you use? Something that blocks muscarinic receptors? Yeah, so you're going to want some anticholinergic cholinergic antagonist. Um, so what's, what happens in the other eye? If let's say you shine the light in one eye, but then you check out the other eye, what's happening in the other eye? It also does the same thing. It's even the also exactly. So that's, you know, that is something if you, if you do it at home, it's kind of cool to see because it's not, it's not so obvious it's going to happen at first. But from what we've been talking about, it totally makes sense. You know, we talked about how you have each eyeball send messages to both brains, right? Both brain, both hemispheres. So if you shine a light in one eye, that's going here and it's going here. Right, so both sides of the brain are getting information, are getting excited when you shine light into one eye because of what we were talking about a little earlier today. Because of, you know, each eye sends half, half of its view into one hemisphere, half the other half of its view into the other hemisphere. So it's not that shocking that the response is going to be on both sides of the body because the stimulus actually gets equally distributed to both sides, hemispheres of the brain, right? As opposed to that ciliospinal reflex where you were just kind of pinching the back of the neck there, that was staying more ipsilateral. You know, there, there you did not, you had the stimulus stayed on one side of the brain and came back on that same side of the brain. Um, so you should know, you should kind of review the, review the, what do you call them? The, the reflexes. Nerve, nerve stimulation. Let me talk, I want to make sure we have time to talk about the nerve stimulation lab, because that's another one that kind of gets people confused sometimes. independent dependent variables.
the independent variable was the location of the stimulus. So either finger or back of the calf. The other independent variable was the frequency of the stimulus. Exactly. So we varied both of them. We varied location, either did it on the calf or the finger, and also frequency. How many, how many zits, how many pulses of current electrical current per second were being delivered into the skin? And then the dependent variable. The sensory threshold. The sensory threshold. And again, this is kind of like in the enzyme lab. The independent variables were easy. Location is just where you stick the electrode, finger or calf. Frequency, you just set the stimulator to tell it one hertz, five hertz. This was the trickier part. How did we actually measure the sensory threshold for any particular condition? Are you asking how we measured the sensory threshold? Yeah, how, how, what was the procedure to actually get a number for the sensory threshold for any particular location or frequency or anything? Well, um, we had the stimulus in milliamps and then we just changed, um, like, what do you call it? Like increased it to see and recorded the number to see when the subject would feel it. Yeah, so, yeah, so basically, right, you just keep increasing it more. And can you feel it? Not yet. Let's increase it some more. Can you feel it now? Not yet. All right, let's So you just have to keep increasing it until, bing, they feel it. Then you should double check. Like, like I said, sometimes people get false positives. So you want to go a little higher, make sure they're still feeling it. Pretend you're giving a stimulus and make sure they don't feel it, even if there's nothing there. Um, so, but once you feel pretty comfortable that this voltage of what was the current electrical current they feel it at, if it's lower than that, they can't feel it, then I know I have landed on the threshold. I write that down as my threshold for that condition. Um, and what did we find? What were the results for this experiment? So overall, the fingers definitely had a lower threshold. Right. And why would that make sense? Because the fingers have more touch receptors than the cat, back of the calf. Yeah, so they can have way more little nerve endings to try to recruit at the same time than you would have like in the in the calf. And frequency, what happened is frequency went up. The threshold decreased. Uh -huh. Exactly. Why? Why would that make sense? Temporal summation. That idea of temporal summation. If you are hitting the same area in quick succession before the cells have had a chance to go back and normalize to their resting, then you actually start adding up. You start kind of stacking up the excitation. So a small excitation in quick succession actually starts adding to itself and can bring everything up to threshold when a single pulse at that smaller level wouldn't have been enough. So, and we saw that in very nice, nice data as well. Um, okay, nerve stimulation lab. Any questions about that one? No, I was just going to ask if we we're going to talk about the um, diffusion demos. Oh, diffusion, sure. Diffusion demo. Yeah, we could do that. There was just a couple of things there. One was um, methylene blue versus potassium permanganate. And we put them in little little wells in these 
Petri dishes. And we saw that the potassium permanganate moved out much faster just by diffusion compared to the methylene blue. And why, why did that make sense? I think the molecular weight was less. Yeah, exactly. This, this thing weighs like half as much as this. So the same amount of energy is just going to be able to go much farther, right? We talked about momentum, like you know, I talked about like a finger flick of energy in a peanut. It's going to sail across a room and a finger flick of energy on a, on a watermelon, it's barely going to budge, right? So given that diffusion is just movement due to just the intrinsic energy of things, if you're much smaller, that intrinsic energy is going to have you moving much faster and farther. Um, we also watched the video of just the little pollen grains in the water. If you just look at pollen grains in water under a microscope, what do you see? I see Grace's head. They move around. They move around. They jiggle and wiggle, right? Um, and they're not alive. I mean, they, they are alive, but they're not moving under their own power. Um, they're not going anywhere. Um, why are they wiggling and jiggling? The water molecules bumping into them. Yeah, so this, you know, this idea, you know, things are in motion at this submicroscopic atomic level or molecular level. The water is going crazy. And every time the pollen grains are small enough and light enough that as they get hit by the water molecules, they jerk around. And under, especially under the microscope, that movement is enough that you can actually see it very clearly. So the more you look smaller and smaller levels, the more everything is just kind of wiggling and jiggling and vibrating. Even if like, you know, you look at a, this looks like, oh, it's just a pen, you know, as solid as plastic, it hits my teeth or whatever. But it, the more you get tinier and tinier and tinier, things get weirder and weirder and weirder. Um, things, yeah. If you ever, if you, I don't know, if people end up taking advanced physics classes, just like what more and more what we think stuff is and energy is just gets weirder and weirder. Um, but it's a good approximation that just car, solid, human, solid, don't let them hit. <laughs> um, what else? You know, then all the rest of the labs were the sens sensory labs. You know, you should, for each of those, kind of know what, what we did. Um, again, the ones that I've been grading mm -hmm. so far, most people got seem to be on track. Um, one thing that I did not, I wasn't so sure that everybody got was idea of the negative after image. Like when you put your hand in warm water, we had people put their hand in warm water and at first it feels warm. And what happens after it's been in there for like a couple of minutes? What does it feel like? I mean, it kind of feels like you're just one with the water. Yeah, exactly. You don't really, you adapt. You kind of, as long as it's not uncomfortably warm, you kind of just even, doesn't even feel like anything. Um, but then you put your other hand in there that's just been sitting in the room. And what does this hand feel like? warm it's warm because it's going to get that relative thing it's going from the room into there so even though this hand just feels like it's adapted doesn't feel anything this hand is all of a sudden like whoa it's actually warm and this hand's like saying what i don't take, feel that um so that's a version of adaptation then we did another one which is even cooler where and again not i think a lot of people 
didn't quite get this because so we had three three jar three things that you're supposed to use they're supposed to be cool and some people even though i said don't use ice water it's not supposed to, some people i'm reading in their thing and it's like in the ice water my hand was dying and it's like go oh, you're not supposed to do that um so it was supposed to be cool but comfortable this was supposed to be warm but comfortable and this was supposed to be in the middle neither one of these was supposed to be painful and i was trying to say i mean i, I did say if it's painful it's not right take your hand out readjust the temperature and then do it again but instead i'm reading these things and it's like oh it's like my hand was tingling and weird and like it's like no and also the other thing is like i was like make sure you tell me about your sensation of temperature and a lot of people talked about the tingling or the shock or this or that but it's like i want to know does it feel hot or cold um but this one if you do it well can be really cool right the first part is kind of like the one i just described you put the hand in the warm water and after a while it just feels like water you put your hand in the cool water and after a while it just feels like water and then you put them both into here and then you're going to get what we call that negative after image because this is warming up this hand is actually going to feel hot this hand is actually cooling down this hand's going to feel cold even though they're both in the same water and i don't care if it's tingly or this i just want to know what's the temperature in one hand versus the other and if you do this well it's a really cool experience to have this just radically different experience in the same water with the two hands um one of the things i'll leave you with so are, are there any other questions about any of the stuff from the lab i'm realizing it's already 12 30. so what i want to this is something you're going to have to do at home because um it doesn't it does the the speed that things transmit through through zoom is not good enough but i'm going to just show you what you're going to do and it seems people just leave things for like two months after we say like let's do this right after you're done with class but i'd say do this do this do this today do this now because it's really fun and weird and cool um so you're gonna go i'm gonna share the module let me see where i put it i put it I put it here. It's under this week. It's right next to this first hand experience with rods and cones, which you should also be doing this week. It says visual YouTube visual motion after effect. So this is also an after image. Like if your vision gets used to something in this case, you're going to open this thing up and you just stare right into the middle of it, you know, you, and again, you do this at home. It's not going to work so much. Um, it's going to last 30 seconds. You just stay fixated right into the middle of it. Don't don't take your vision away. Stay right into the middle of it. And then when it stops, look at your hands. Look at your friend's face. Look at whatever. And I think it'll freak you out. But it's the same basic idea. The same idea that your body is getting used to something, is adapting to it until that is the normal and then when, when you take that away, all of a sudden what's normal doesn't seem normal anymore. It's gonna be the opposite of what your body had adapted to. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you go onto that YouTube thing on a screen. It's gonna take you 30 seconds. Just stare in the middle of the kind of pulsing things coming out and this is going to be adaptation at a more central thing it's happening in your brain rather than in the receptor um, but your system is just going to get used to this is the new normal and then when it stops what 
used to be normal isn't going to look normal. It's going to look, it's going to, again, be a negative after image. Look at your hands. That's kind of the weirdest thing is just to look at your hands and see what happens to your hands when you look at them. You know, and that'll be, I think, I think you'll dig it. Um, if you have questions about any of the lab stuff, you know, you can email me. Um, we'll also have questions before we actually have the lab exam. Um, Please, in the next two days, upload your table of contents as well. Um, and otherwise, I'm at office hours, but we are officially done. Dr. E? Uh -huh. So, um, as the uh, gustational affection and hearing labs, will those be on the lab exam? Absolutely. Okay. 